Let's take a few moments to center our hearts and minds on the presence of God. Let this time be a moment where we seek His face, find His peace, and rest in His sovereignty. And this is In The Moment. I'm your host, Reverend Ricky Allen Jr. You're thanking you as always on this lovely day the Lord has made and wherever you are. Whatever you're doing, as I always say, I just pray that the Lord Jesus Christ is leading the way for you and your family. You are blessed. You are highly favored. It's going to be okay. God saw it too. God's going to respond. And I live by those words as well. So let's get started. Let's turn to Revelation 15, verses 3 through 4 for our morning scripture reading. Let us listen to the words of God as they reveal his power and majesty today. Revelation 15, 3 through 4 reads as follows. And they sang the song of God's servant Moses and of the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Amen. And this reminds us of the ultimate victory and justice of our Lord, who reigns over all nations and is indeed worthy of all worship. And if you're out there and you needed that reminder, well, there you go. Because I know there's a lot going on, it's election season, and you might be a little concerned. Well, there is one thing you can do in your home right now, and that is pray. And if you're not praying, you should be praying. And of course, if you have any prayer requests that you want to have us come alongside you and pray with you for, go to get-prayer.com, get-prayer.com for all your prayer needs. And we will definitely respond efficiently and pray for you and pray with you. So with that being said, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today, lifting up our nation into your hands. We acknowledge that you are the sovereign ruler of all the earth. We pray for our leaders that they may seek wisdom from you, govern with justice, and lead with humility. Lord, bring healing to the land, to our land, the place where we live. Restore unity where there is division, and there is quite a bit of it out there. And guide us in the paths of righteousness. And may your peace, which transcends all understanding, guard the hearts and minds of all who live in this country. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, through the intervention of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our topic of the day is God's calm against national rage. God's calm against national rage. And you know... There is just uh, a lot, as I keep saying, because it's true, we have a lot going on right now in this country when it comes to national rage. Why is that? Because we have more and more people out here that are working their best to remove God from the canvas of this country. They believe that if there was no Christ to be worried about when it comes to the call to repentance and conviction and acceptance as to have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and to have that relationship. They, these folks believe that if that wasn't around, we'd be a better place. And well, that's a misdirection. That is, uh, that's deception because they just want to do whatever they want to do, just like they're doing right now. And in these environments of lawlessness that we see, out here throughout the country and you ask yourself well what in the world's going on why is this happening who's allowing this to happen doesn't god see what's going on and as we move forward into this election season we're going to address a little bit of that but today we're coming from psalm 2 psalm 2 i'll be reading that turn to your bibles to psalm 2 uh it's a very uh short verse 12 verses and it's easy to find. <laughs> it's the second uh, psalm in the books of psalm. All right, so let us start here, Psalm 2. Why do nations conspire and the people's plot in vain? 
The kings of the earth rise up, and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss his son or he will be angry and your way will lead to your destruction. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the reading of your already blessed word. We ask you now, Lord, to help us dive into this psalm. Help us pull out the things you want us to see and understand about your majesty, your royalty, your understanding from your viewpoint. Maybe that will calm some people out here when they turn on the news and they see nothing but craziness. Maybe that will reassure them and remind them that you see everything that's going on and everything does not go to waste to your will and to your way. These are things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God's national, God's calm against the national rage. When we think about what's going on right now, in today's society, when we think about uh, all the things that we're seeing on the internet, the things that people are doing, that are actually choosing to do, <laughs> this is not something they're being made to do, they're, being, they're choosing to do this, whether it's for money, whether it's for popularity, validation, whatever the case is, it's very important to understand that God saw it too. And sometimes we as believers kind of forget that. We think that we've got to do all this work for God. No, you don't. God can, God can be God by himself. <laughs> it is our job to share the gospel. That's what Christ told us to go do. Go and disciple the nations, baptizing, and bringing them into remembrance of all things that have been taught. And sometimes we get lost in the great debate, this great defense, because we see people being led astray. And some of them are not being led astray. They are choosing to be led astray. Now, that's a hard, hard fact because you're looking at them as with innocent eyes and with love and they don't understand. Okay, let's be real. A lot of them do and they're choosing this. I, I don't want to discourage you very overzealous Christians out there. I, I, I don't want to discourage you, but it's true. And it's time to face facts. There are many things going on in this nation, not because people don't know. This is willful ignorance. There's a lot of things going on in this nation for years that believers knew about, but we're not active in. When it comes to our politics, the society as a whole, we saw it going on. But then it began to do a little thing called affect us. And now everybody's going crazy, even though you saw this writing on the wall years ago. And it's time to hold ourselves accountable as God's ambassadors to realize we did not do everything maybe we could have done at that time in our communities. Uh, it doesn't matter where you live at. We didn't do enough as a church body, regardless of where your church is at. And then now here we are. We're in a nation of lawlessness. And you're wondering, for some, not all, where's God? Where is God in all this? When we look at understanding God's calm, we gotta first of all look at the nations in uproar, verses one through three. The first thing you see is a world in revolt. The psalm opens up with a vivid depiction of the nations in uproar. The words conspire and plot tell us, they give us a sense of 
coordinated rebellion against God's authority. And we see this coordinated rebellion. When we think about the laws that are being passed and what the educational system is doing, we see everything is very organized, well-coordinated. The kings and rulers of the earth representing the national and global powers banding together in defiance. There's a lot of wars going on out here right now and people protesting, going crazy. Do you think they would be going this crazy if it was two countries that did not believe in the God of the Bible, but one of them does? And so they chose the other side. And then there is this illusion of autonomy. Their declaration to break their chain symbolizes this desire to overthrow what they perceive as divine restrictions. They think they're helping us by quote unquote freeing us from the God that we serve willingly. This is, this is what they think. They're thinking if you just had a taste of how we live and what we do and how we do it, you would understand that it is okay, says every alcoholic, says every promiscuous person, says everybody living a life contrary to God's will. They all say the same thing. To cast off God's rule and to assert their autonomy. This is a picture of national rage where human pride seeks to rebel against the Lord thy God. But yet, when we see a world of revolt and we see the illusion of autonomy, there's also the futility of rebellion. Despite their collective rage and rebellion, their efforts are described as in vain. And we've talked about this word because it's seen throughout many Psalms is uh, you're going to you're going to get all the way through this process of doing all these stuff and things. And you're not going to hit your desired goal or result in the end. You don't see it at first until you get all the way through it and realize you didn't achieve anything. Ellen and cause more chaos, more confusion and more imbalance. That's all you have done, O sinner. That's why I ask you today, come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Come to his feet and repent and confess and be saved. Yet, despite their collective rage and rebellion, their efforts are described as in vain. It sets the stage for the calmness of God, who is neither threatened nor alarmed by their actions. Do you actually think God is worked up? No, because he understands this is who they have chosen to be. They didn't, bo they weren't born that way. No, they weren't born that way. We're all born into sin, but like plants that like the weed and the rose that grows beside each other. Guess what? The weed's going to get bigger and the rose is going to get bigger. One's going to bloom and one's what's going to exist. <laughs> one's just going to be there, not serving an actual purpose other than taking up space and causing problems for the other plants. And then there is God's calm response. We see this in verses four through six. And when we think about God's calm response, we think about the divine laughter in the face of chaos. In stark contrast to the turmoil of the nations, God's response is one of divine calm. Do you want divine calm today? Then act like God is acting right now. Don't get so worked up on every comment made on the internet, thinking that you're making a difference, thinking that your response is going to be the response of responses. No, practice some divine calm. Practice prayer. Get, get into your prayer life. Ask the Lord to provide a means and a methodology to reach people in a way that they're going to receive it. Not behind a keyboard where people can protect themselves. Now you're fighting on their turf. This is what they do. And they do it very, very well. And you look up and they're bothering you at work and they 
they're banding together online and try to take you out and ruin your career and ruin your social life because that is their home field advantage. And when you are the visitor at anybody's home field, it's a hard place to play in because you got to deal with their fans and you got to deal with an environment they know how to play on. The image of God laughing at the nations underscores the supreme authority and the utter futility of their rebellion. It's a laughter not out of amusement, don't get it twisted here, but of confidence in his unshakable sovereignty. As I've told y'all time and time again, there are some things you got to understand about your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Either you're going to believe God is sovereign, as in he knows all, sees all, he's, he's everywhere at the same time, or, and, and, not or, but and, you got to have hope in Christ. Believe God is sovereign, have hope in Christ. Do those two things, you're going to be fine. Nothing out here is going to bother you. Nothing at all. Don't, it, humanly, yes, you're going to get a little emotional, but spiritually, you're going to be just fine. It's like going up to the gate and looking out into the world and seeing utter chaos and confusion and saying, okay, but God's got control of that, so we're good. That's what it, what it comes down to. That, that's that divine calmness. Knowing that God has it under control, knowing there's a plan that's in place, knowing that you may or may not be part of that plan. And that's okay too. Take care of what God has given you to take care of. Take care of your home, your marriage, your family inside your house. Then look out to your neighborhood. See where you can serve there. And then go a little further. And then go a little further. Work on the things that are in front of you, not the things that are way ahead of you. But not only do we look at the divine laughter in the face of chaos, we see a decree unmoved by human rage. God's calm is rooted in his knowledge of the outcome. He's not threatened by the rage of the nations because his plan is already in place. It's like a child who's going crazy in the Walmart because they're not getting what they want. And you're sitting there and you're, you know, dealing with that because you already know the outcome. I'm going to go pay for these groceries and we're going to go home. That's it. You can cry and get all worked up all you want. And we've all been there. I know I have. I've had two sons. I mean, they're grown now. But during that time of our parenting, you picked them up, put them in the cart, kept it moving, paid for your groceries, went on home. It's not threatened by the rage of the nations. His response is also decisive. Look, look at the, the response. I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. This reveals that despite the human attempts to resist all the stuff and things, God's purposes will prevail. It doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't matter what they do. It doesn't matter how crazy it may get. I totally get it. The plan of God is going to see itself through. So you can watch these folks a lot of people on, you know, on the political spectrum and you can see where people are being misleading, call them into accountability, keep it moving because at the end of the day, God's plan will prevail. Things happen for things to happen. And that first thing may not be the best of things, as I say this time and time again, but because we serve a God that's both alpha and omega, beginning in and in in he is the author and finisher of our faith we know he's got it under control it is our job to respond to the cross by what we say how we say it what we do and how we do it and then we get to zion the unshakable seat of power Zion represents God's dwelling place and the seat of his rule. And guess what? You can't move it. Laws can't move it. <laughs> Protests can't move it. So get over it. The installation of his king, ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ, is a sign that God's unchanging plan is unaffected by the chaos of the world. The faith moves on. 
God has never dealt in the thousands and millions. If you look through the Old Testament, you see he's always dealt with the twos and fews. You're so worried about being one of three Christians at a golf club or one of four Christians at a social event. You're more worried about the numbers than you are the witness. And that's a problem for many of our churches out here. We're more worried about how many folks are coming and what all the quantifiable data. Of course, we want to be effective. Of course, we want to make sure we're doing what the Lord has called us to do as a church, a body to be effective, to bear what scripture calls good fruit. But let's look, let's look at the quality of data. Let's look at, okay, are you actually following what the Lord has said you to do, regardless of what the numbers look like? Because as, as I said in January of this year, God does not send broken people to broken systems. Now, you might look as broken as you can't get nothing done. That's not exactly true. Maybe you are getting some things done, but you got some tweaks and peaks you got to work on in other places. Maybe there are some places there that are slightly broken or majorly broken. You got to fix those things and then watch God respond to your obedience and your self-control, your accountability, and being able to recognize and confess that yes, this is incorrect, let's fix it, and let's move forward as a body of Christ. But yet, it's gonna keep moving because God is unshakable, God is unstoppable, and whether you believe in him or not, he is still there. Let's move on to verses seven and nine, this unstoppable decree we keep talking about. First of all, let's consider this a father's declaration. The Lord's decree is a powerful statement of his sovereign will. The declaration, you are my son today, I have become your father, it emphasizes the special relationship between God and his anointed king, a relationship that finds its ultimate expression in Jesus Christ. And then there is the promise of the global dominion. This promise that the nations will be given as an inheritance reveals the global scope of the rule of Jesus Christ. God's calmness stems from his overall ultimate control over the destiny of the nations. While they may rage, their fate is still in his hands. And then there is the power to shatter resistance. This imagery of the rod of iron and the dashing of the nations like pottery illustrates the unstoppable power of God's decree. It's a reminder that human rage, no matter how intense, is powerless against God's sovereign plan. The calmness of God is not passive, but is accompanied by the assurance of his eventual triumph. It's like an anime I was watching a few months ago where one of them said, whatever you do, do not throw a punch. Why is that? Because that would acknowledge that there was some truth to what they were saying. And he ordered everybody, don't throw a punch. Don't even engage it. Why? Because in the end, eventually, this person was going to win out. They were going to be validated by their work and their efforts but you're validated by your faith. And sitting there debating someone about your faith after you've explained why you believe and why you have this hope that you have, and they're still bumping the gums, you're wasting your breath at that point. You've done what you need to say, close the conversation and move on. Because eventually you will win because God's gonna reveal them, himself to them. And from there, prayerfully, they will see and understand the God that you serve. And then there's verses 10 through 12, which is this call to submission and peace. There is wisdom in submission. The Psalm concludes with a call to wisdom, um, encouraging the kings and rulers of the earth to recognize the foolishness of their rage and the futility of it and to submit to God's authority. Wisdom here is equated with humility and submission to God's rule. Then there is the reverence, not rebellion. 
Serving the Lord with fear and celebrating his rule with trembling acknowledges his rightful place as sovereign overall. My question to you today is, is the Lord sovereign for you overall? Does he rule your home? Does he rule you, your wife, your husband, your kids, your job, your everything? A lot of problems begin in the Christian home where God is not the head of the household. And you've fallen into these demonic doctrines of, well, I'm going to let my child uh, figure out what he wants to do in regards to religion. And well, I'm going to make let him make the decision without education. He must educate. He or she must educate themselves all of a sudden. You tell them they got to get up and go to school. You tell them uh, what outfits they're going to wear today for picture day and all that stuff. And you're telling them everything you need to do as a parent. And yet, the most important thing in their life, you leave up to them. Because for whatever reason, we have become so ignorant to the fact that we're saying we're Christians, we say we believe in Jesus Christ, but yet it becomes individualized in the home and not a collective effort as a home to serve the Lord. Your home is a little itty bitty church. And men, you're the pastor. Women, you're the assistant pastor. And you're all members of this little itty bitty church that glorifies God in the neighborhood. But yet, some, for whatever reason, we've allowed society to tell us, oh, well, it's not your responsibility to, to, to teach them religion. Let them figure that out. on. Let them make their own decisions on that. Yet you have laws in place that if the kid decides he doesn't want to eat, well, that's child neglected. If they don't eat, they pass out. Someone's calling ser child services all of a sudden. You, you, let, you, you don't get these rights anywhere else. But when it comes to a relationship with Jesus Christ, all of a sudden we got problems. And then there's refuge of peace. The final verse offers a message of hope. Blessed are all who take refuge in them. In the midst of the national rage, those who seek refuge in God find peace and security. God's calm is not just a distant reality, but a present refuge for those who trust in him. People hold the line maintain i know it's hard i know it's difficult but there is hope and if you need that hope contact us by the information provided earlier in the show get dash prayer.com go to our website there you can submit prayers all day long and remember through this national rage god is still on the throne and is still calm as ever and you should be too may god bless you may heaven smile upon you and God willing, we will talk to you next, next week. You take care.